questions by our participants, because usually um, we have the Q&A session and we also ask the participants to um, just post their questions on our chat. But uh, we can also make this event more uh, interactive. So uh, people ca can also potentially interrupt you and ask questions during your talk. So what are, what are your preferences? Uh, sure, uh, please feel free to stop me, ask questions. Um, so when we uh, share the screen, we won't be able to, I won't be able to see the screen. So I would appreciate if moderator yes. can forward that question. Okay, no, no, no problem. <clears throat> so yeah, if there are any questions, I would just try to uh, interrupt. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I can see that we also have uh, Javier with another facilitator for today. Hello, Javier. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to be here. Yes. How are you, right. Powell? Good, good. I'm fine in general. Great. So <laughs> Okay, I'm going to be here. If you need any uh, support, please let me know. Okay, great. Thank you. So yeah, you can you can also monitor the chat, and <clears throat> uh, if you find any questions that are not uh, answered yet, then also please please feel free to interrupt as well. Sure. Uh, so at the beginning, I will just present uh, the slides with uh, just some announcements regarding our future talks in the next months, and yeah, there are some information about to Egypt, to Poland, to Mexico. Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. Yeah, um, I will just mention that the last talk uh, in your slide, the first May, the time is Sunday, 9 a.m. Eastern, okay? Just mention that because it was... Uh, okay. mistaken. Yeah, it's right. 9 a.m. to 11, and just mention that because mistakenly okay. it was initially, it was before in a wrong time, but I corrected it yesterday, okay? Okay, yeah, that's fine. All right. Mm -hmm. So it will start at 9 a.m., yes? Yes. So in the morning, okay. That is a Sunday, actually. Sunday, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have 36 participants, so usually the a bit more, so let's maybe wait for one more minute and we'll start. Yeah, 38. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I understand that this meeting is uh, streamed directly to YouTube, right? So uh, do we also need to uh, record it ind independently? Because I can see that there is such an option to start recording. Oh, I, I can do the recording. Okay, yeah, so if you can do it. I believe that if there is live streaming on YouTube, then uh, the video will be available on uh, our YouTube channel anyway, but maybe just in case you can also uh, start recording soon. So, so Helen, would you like to start now? Because it looks that... Okay. So I think we can start. Uh, so hello, everyone. Welcome to the next uh, meetup organized jointly by quantum computing groups from uh, Washington, uh, to Mexico, to Egypt, uh, Warsaw, Warsaw Quantum Computing Group, and Toronto Quantum Computing Meetup. Uh, my name is Pavel Gora, and I'm one of the facilitators of this meeting. Um, another one is Dr. Javier Ordus, so Javier is also with us. And we also have Karim Al Safti from, uh, from Egypt. And um, today we have a pleasure to host a great speaker, Dr. Kamal Choudhary. And he will give a talk about quantum computation for predicting electron and, pho and photon properties of solids. So before we start, uh, I would like to announce that uh, this meeting is recorded as usually. There's also live streaming on our YouTube. And 
if you have any questions, please post your questions on our chat, but uh, you can also potentially interrupt. So I believe that it will be better if you just uh, post your questions on chat and uh, me and or Javier or Karim will try to interrupt and ask the question. And at, anyway, at the end, that will be also a dedicated to end day session. Um, okay, so before we start, we'd also like to announce um, our next meetings, next meetups. So the next one will be on next uh, Saturday, and the title is Quantum Circuit Optimization. Uh, and one week later, we'll have a talk about uh, a brief history of effective abstraction from numbers to tensors. Um, at the end of March, there will be talk given by Zeki Seskir a computer science oriented approach to introduce quantum computing to a new audience. Later in April, there will be a talk how to succeed as a quantum computing application startup. Sounds interesting as well. Later in April, the theory of quantum uh, teleportation. Okay. Um, then on 16th of April, quantum art and the quantum metaverse. And uh, finally, on 1st of May, there will be a talk titled Quantum Computing and Quantum Cryptography. And uh, so it's, it's Sunday, so it will start at 9 a.m. Uh, EDT. Um, and we would also like to thank our sponsors, partners, Quantum AI Foundation, Warsaw Quantum Computing Meetup. So I'm a representative uh, of the Warsaw Quantum Computing Group and the Quantum AI Foundation. Uh, also Quantum Computing and um, Data Science Group from Toronto, uh, Orion X Association Quantum, Cambridge Quantum, Q Egypt. So uh, Karim Al Safti, our facilitator, is a representative of Q Egypt. I'm also representative of Q Poland, and we also have uh, Javier Ordus from Q Mexico. So I will now stop sharing my slides. And uh, Kamal, if you are ready, the Zoom is yours, and you can start. Uh, sharing your screen and start your presentation. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you, everyone, and uh, for being here. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Okay. Could you confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, I can see it. All right. So, yeah, welcome, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us today. My name is Kamal Chaudhary. I'm a research scientist at NIST, Maryland. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk about uh, really one of the most interesting topic I've been working on recently, uh, quantum computation for predicting electronic, electron and phonon properties of solids. Um, this project is a part of the NIST Jarvis infrastructure, which is available at jarvis.nist.gov. It's a part of a materials genome initiative at NIST. And again, I would like to thank, thank all the Washington DC uh, quantum computing meetup group. I think this is one of the most uh, vibrant uh, community of quantum, quantum computing I've seen so far. So really uh, good to be a part of this and um, presenting this group. And as I think Powell said, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put in the chat and I'll try to do my best to answer your questions um, while we are uh, going through this. Um, Okay, so here is a brief outline of my uh, talk. I have 25 slides. And first I'll give a motivation slides behind this work. Um, I do not know the background of all my audience here. So I'll give a very brief introduction to what is a database of materials and so on. And uh, a brief introduction to solid state bands theory of solids. And what is quantum computation and I'm, I'm assuming that most of you guys are already familiar with this, but I thought it's still useful to give some uh, background on that. And after covering those background, I'll go into the detail of how do we use those quantum computing algorithms for simulating uh, solids. And we'll start with very simple metals such as aluminum, and then apply to more than 1,000 solids. And then uh, we will see that what's the effect of how to use quantum computation for many body methods. And if, you, if time permits, I have a small notebook that I can share with you guys for a hands-on session. And then uh, I'll have a summary and feature work that is still going on. And one of the reason I'm presenting this talk to you guys is if you guys are interested in uh, wor working or extending this work that I'm gonna present to you, or if you have any question further so that we can connect over email or I don't know, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, so that we can actually further um, 
make this progress uh, in this particular field. So this is the motivation behind my work. Um, I think this is a quote by uh, Richard Feynman that if you want to simulate nature, which is quantum, uh, you have to use quantum computers. So, and one of the uh, main building block of quantum computers are qubits. So we'll talk about how to use qubits for uh, simulating quantum systems. And when I say quantum systems, what it really means is um, you have a Hamiltonian, uh, uh, you have a, that is basically a Hermitian matrix. That's what uh, a quantum system is basically. And the idea is to get the eigenvalue and eigenfunction of that matrix. So, um, and uh, we once we have that eigenfunction and eigenvalues of that Hermitian matrix, we can get uh, a number of properties from there. And one of the properties of interest for today's talk is given a, a compound, can we tell it whether it's metal, semiconductor, or insulator? So if you look at the periodic table, uh, it has like 100 elements, right? And there are different ways to arrange it. So you can take, for example, aluminum and uh, silicon and mix it in a particular way. It will make certain kind of material. Then you take magnesium and cobalt and mix it in a way that becomes a certain kind of material. So one of the question is if I take this particular combinatrix, a huge combinatrix that will lead to uh, billions and trillions or maybe more than that uh, compound that is possible, then uh, how could we know the properties of such materials? We can, uh, one of the most uh, promising techniques is the quantum uh, theory that is uh, solving Schrodinger equation. And uh, based on that, we get uh, something called energy level, which I'll show you. And from there, we can uh, calculate the uh, metal semiconductor and insulator. And I believe personally that quantum computation is going to play a very huge and important role in solving this very uh, unsolved problem of uh, simulating billions and trillions of solids on quantum computers. This is my personal belief. Um, and I'll, sh I'll give an introduction to the solid state theory, but uh, I'll also talk about one of my favorite theory called one year tide binding approach, which is very useful for simulating such systems on quantum computer. And I'll also mention why it is important to use this presentation. After that, I'll give a universal workflow for electron and phonon dynamics of solids. And I'll show you one of the key differences between using classical computers and quantum computers is the circuit design, quantum circuit design, and how does it, uh, how, uh, how important role it plays in uh, designing the different materials such as solids. And then I'll also, uh, if I have time, I'll talk about how uh, one of the application of the quantum computers is putting large Hamiltonian. And um, so we'll, if I, if I get time, I'll talk about that too as well. So, so this is the motivation. Um, before I go in the detail of quantum computation, I would like to advertise our NIST Jarvis infrastructure. It is available at the um, jarvis.nist.gov. It's a free login. You can log in there uh, with your credentials such as username, and you can access to multiple resources such as density, theory, machine learning, molecular dynamics, and so on, quantum computation. This project was started in 2017 using something called Materials Genome Initiative. The Materials Genome Initiative is uh, very similar to the genome project, the gene sequencing, but for materials domain. And it was started by uh, former President Barack Obama in 2011, so about 10 years, 11 years ago. Uh, so Jarvis started in 2017, about five years ago. Uh, and we have a ton of articles, uh, peer-reviewed articles, and thousands of users worldwide. As you can see from this chart here, uh, our user base. We have uh, organizing uh, artificial intelligence for material science and quantum matter for material science workshops. We have more than 200 attendees per year. And we are, uh, I think we are gonna do this virtual this year because of pandemic, of course. Um, and yeah, and there are several tools available also in Jarvis. So once you go there, jarvis.nist.gov, you'll find a YouTube uh, video, hopefully, and that will hopefully help you uh, guide through the Jarvis infrastructure and also get an update of, of, of upcoming workshop and so on. So I highly encourage you to sign up for this. Also, if you want to know more about Jarvis, uh, there is a Nature NPJ Computational Materials article that was published in two years ago. Feel free to check that out. So um, I don't have time to go into detail of Jarvis, but I want to point out last five years, we have expanded a lot. And we have several projects, several uh, people from different national labs, different universities working together to solve this materials problem. And we started in 2017 with molecular dynamics, then we applying for uh, density functional theory, machine learning, uh, and uh, quantum mechanical principle. And uh, I'll skip all the others. I'll just focus on the Jarvis Atom QC today, atom quantum, atomistic quantum computation. 
and that will be the key focus of this particular talk. So again, I encourage you, if you want to know more about Jarvis, go to the jarvis.nist.gov. And if you have any question, feel free to reach our team or reach me. Uh, I will be happy to uh, work with you. So I was thinking before I was giving this talk uh, about this talk, like how, because I don't know who my audience is. So I thought I'll give a brief a background on band theory of solids. Uh, these are some of the terms that I'll be uh, bringing up together a lot of times. So I thought it'll be good to uh, um, talk about them. So when you, uh, if you are not familiar at all with band theory of solids, uh, I would recommend at least these two books, Solid State Physics by Ascot Merman and the Electronic Structure by uh, Richard Martin. Uh, pretty useful for uh, solid state material design or quantum com uh, quantum calculation, not quantum computation. Um, <clears throat> so we start with free electron model. This is one of the pioneer model by Arnold Sommerfeld. And he described uh, the electrons as weakly bound uh, uh, wave. And, uh, and but we, we found that there were several limitations to the model. Uh, so it, it can work well for metallic solids, but not really for uh, uh, like covalent compound and so on. Then the next theory was nearly free electrons models. So the nearly idea is we have a weak potential. So we have a plane waves uh, and a delocalized wave. And then we start as adding some perturbation, small perturbation in terms of weak potential. And that leads to something called nearly free electron model. Um, another approach is tight binding model, which I'm gonna use today in our present work. It is exactly opposite to uh, the uh, free electron model. So again, coming back to the original idea of uh, quantum mechanics, wave particle duality, so if you think that free electron model is considering the wave nature of electrons, then a uh, tight binding is taking the kind of the particle nature of electrons. So, uh, and one of the advantage of using tight binding model is the basis set is quite small. So un un unlike the free electron model, so it's easy to simulate this on quantum computers. So I'll show you maybe in a few minutes that if you want to sim simulate silicon band structure, so for example, silicon is maybe on your phone, on your laptop, everywhere is, is full of silicon, right? So if you want to simulate silicon band structure, uh, you can use the plane wave representation, but the basis that it will require is huge, maybe, and then it's, that must makes it challenging to simulate on uh, solid state, on, on quantum computers. But using tight binding appro approximation, uh, we can uh, solve this and make it tractable to uh, use on quantum computers. There are several software packages such as uh, one-year tight binding Hamiltonian, one-year 90, TB 3 pi developed by our group, tight binding three-body Python model, and density functional tight binding group, and so on. Um, I'll be mainly using the WTBS one-year 90 for this particular work. Um, again, density functional theory is another quantum mechanical principle. It's basically, uh, if you look at the Schrodinger equation, and if you look at the uh, simple silicon, right? So there are so many electrons, and if you want to solve the uh, multi, many body electron problem, it will be take uh, it will take huge time to solve that problem. So the idea of density functional theory is, instead of uh, solving for a wave function, you consider the electron density in your problem, and you convert the many electron problem to many one electron problem. And for this particular approximation, Nobel Prize was given in, I think, 1990 or 1996. Uh, I apologize, I forgot the year of Nobel Prize. But uh, Nobel Prize was given by Walter to Walter Kohn and, uh, for this uh, density functional theory. And uh, it's one of the most popular and highly cited uh, quantum calculation um, theory across all physics domain. So it's really popular. And there are several after course uh, for density functional theory, and we'll be using mainly VASP uh, for this particular work. I also thought I'd mention about the block theorem. It says that if you want to solve Schrodinger equation in a periodic potential where you have the uh, lattice, of, like for example, silicon is sitting on a particular design, right, uh, of, uh, of a lattice, then you can, instead of solving for infinite, infinite lattice, you can use periodic functions. And uh, that will give you wave modulated by periodic function that is called block theorem. And when you use block theorem, I also need to point out brilliant zone. So brilliant zone is the uh, primitive cell in the reciprocal lattice. So what we see now is a reciprocal la a real lattice or real space. But when you go to the uh, frequency domain or Fourier domain, that is called reciprocal space. So here did you have particular K points. And if you know the energy at that particular K points, then you know the behavior of the material. That's the promise. Uh, then uh, if you know the block theorem and brilliant zone and choose one of these theory here, you can calculate something called band structure. 
a band structure is uh, is one of the key uh, thing which is described by quantum mechanics only and cannot be described by uh, classical mechanics is that so you know electrons can occupy only certain uh, levels in the uh, energy levels and they cannot they, they are something called fermion region, regions right so you know from the bohr's model and so on um, so that that gap prediction and that gap prediction depends on the crystal momentum or in the reciprocal space so uh, based on that uh, what is your energy level at each key point in your reciprocal brillion zone that gives you something called band structure and the band structure is a very useful quantity a very useful property of a solid that can uh, guide you to design various devices so all the leds you see all the smartphones all the computers laptops they all uh, in in physics physics sense that depend on the band structure if your band structure of your diode doesn't match then it might not need to lead to a led and so on so so in calculating band structure is a very useful uh, um, technique i mean very useful property to calculate and we will saw so that it can be calculated for electrons phonons magnons polaritons excitons everything but today we'll focus on electrons and phonons only so um, so as i said uh, this is these are different levels of theory and all have some advantages and disadvantages some lim limitations and uh, uh, several other uh, techniques are there but uh, this is a basically idea that you have this is the interact in, uh, interaction potential or weak um, lattice potential and for free electron is almost zero and as you go to the tide binding model it uh, increases so um, hopefully this will be uh, give you a brief idea about band structure which will be our focus quantity uh, for this particular talk uh, so i want to uh, uh, um, show you that if if you know this uh, energy levels the forbidden and allowed levels then you can uh, say whether a material will be insulator or metal whether it conduct basically electricity or will not so that is uh, one of the key quantity of this particular stretch uh, uh, talk so uh, i was also thinking to give a, uh, okay this is too loud. Um, Lower the volume a little bit. I thought okay. I will give you a yes. Kam uh, Kamal, can, can, Kamal, can we maybe interrupt because I can see that yeah. the, there is a question. There is a question sure. from Anna. Yeah. Um, in the 1970s, physicists used a method called empirical pseudo potential to study mm -hmm. optical properties of materials. Is this still on the landscape? Yes. Uh, the thing. Thank you for the question. So one of the important quantity is the optical properties of response function and density functional theory is actually evolved from that 1976 or that theory you were saying so uh, i would say that is now uh, uh, baked in that density functional theory approach if that helps your, your question so yeah great Any thanks other um no i don't see more questions now oh. or maybe someone would like to ask now but i think we can go on okay so um, I thought for the general audience, I'll play this video I saw uh, somewhere <laughs> about metal versus insulator in terms of quantum mechanics, right? So what will conduct electricity and what will not? So um, let me lower the volume. And so we have a solid and suppose there's one electron here, one particle. So as you can see, there are only certain levels allowed. This is called allowed level. And then there is a gap between them just because of the quantum mechanical principle, they, this particle is not allowed to have um, any energy level between this, in this formidable zone. So it's very hard to predict a priori what will be these um, levels will be. So this is where quantum mechanics come into play. So this is just one particle. What if we have multiple particles? Then this simulation will show you how this, as we have multiple particles, the scenario changes. So let's see. Oh, okay. No, this is not what I meant. <laughs> so now you can see as we are adding more and more particles and more electrons or phonons, they are making something called band. They are not just single levels. Uh, there's a very uh, close energy levels which forms band. And that's called basically band structure at different key point in the brilliant zone. Here they are showing in this video because of ease, that's just one band, but it can be at different key points also. These are the bands, as I said. 
is our energy piece. For the metal, as you see, they are sharing of electrons. This, this band is being filled up. As it is filled up and there's a gap there, it becomes an insulator. It won't conduct electricity. to this particular group which makes this video yeah so this is what we want to uh, solve well given a material can we can we say whether it's a metal or it's insulator and right now the classical computers are being used to predict this but i'm going to show you how to uh, use that how to predict this using quantum computers and okay. please uh, take a note that I'm not saying that quantum computers have already bit, uh, have beaten the classical computers in solving this problem, but I'm just saying that uh, we are finding an approach, even how to use that approach, how to solve this problem on quantum computers. So please take a note on that. Is there any question? Yes, there's one question from George. Uh, yeah. Are the bands like phase transitions? Are the bands like phase transitions? Um, okay, they are two different things. So. Uh, band, do, do the phase transitions happen due to, uh, you can say the phase transition can be uh, related to uh, the band diagrams, but there are two different things I, in my opinion. Yeah. So, so suppose you know the band levels and you can calculate the total energy of the solids. And then if the phase transformation happens or phase transition happens, then the energy band structure will change. And then you'll have different energy, different local minima. So that's how phase transition happens. Hopefully that answers your question. Any yep. other question? Yes. Um, I don't see more questions on our chat. Maybe someone would like to unmute and ask. Yes. I saw some populating forces in the video and maybe you can explain it. Uh... As the levels, it gets denser and denser, right? Right. Yeah. As these what, levels are being happening? Yeah. Why? Um, it's basically showing that if you are exciting an electron, the with some laser or some uh, other impulse, they will start filling up this band, right? This basically you have one particle, and then you have a sea of particle, and then it's filled here, right? It's basically showing that, for example. It depends on the material, silicon versus aluminum or aluminum, um, nickel, you know, different materials have different electron population based on their atomic number. Okay, where the C of particles coming from if you started from one electron? No, no, this is just for simulation purpose. It's, it's not that we are somebody is adding electrons, it's just in the nature. It's just for simulation we are showing that as more electrons are being added, it fills this band and it makes the band. Um, okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Okay. So if there are no other questions, I'll proceed. Right, Pavel? Um, there's one more question. Um, are bands uh, conducting bands? So bands are conducting bands, right? It's a question bands for me. Are bands. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, okay, so bands and conductance, there are two types of bands called valence band and conduction bands, okay? So, so in this particular case, you'll see that um, these, these bands will be called valence bands because they are occupied and this is unoccupied bonds called conduction band. When, uh, and there is, will be, if there is, if there is a Fermi level within the valence band, uh, then we will say this is a metal, okay? So there are two types of band basically. And if the Fermi level lies between the conduction band and valence band, then we'll call it an insulator because there's a gap there. So yeah, so um, con I think his, his question is about conduction band. So yeah, these are conduction band are usually unoccupied electrons. Suppose you uh, insert your, uh, um, your electricity. So the some electrons will be uh, uh, coming from that source. It will hit this uh, pool of electrons. 
this electron will go to the uh, uh, um, conduction band and then they will start conducting conducting electricity right so that is the mechanism what happens when you plug your uh, charger or something on the computer or whatever okay um, there is one more question about reference that introduces a density functional theory but maybe we can just provide it at the end yeah sure i can i can send some good references and also i find that the wikipedia article density functional theory is not too bad yeah so you can look into that too okay all right i think we can go on okay Okay, so now comes quantum computers. So um, I really like to point out this. I uh, do these two key, key papers from Richard Feynman. Uh, he's really one of my uh, role model, you can say. Right. Uh, so I, I start reading. I start. I enjoy reading his papers. So these two papers are the key, in my opinion, for quantum computers enthusiasts. So especially this simulating physics with computers. So he in, in this paper is like I think it's like a hundred page or some paper. Like this, when he was at Caltech, he showed that why uh, computers are needed. I mean, you can predict properties using physical laws like Newton's law, uh, Coulomb law. So why do we need computers? So here he shows that all the laws that are there in physics, they come. There is a, some limitations, and to cope with limitations and and solve this in more. Uh, rigorous and robust way we need computers so this is the i think a key article i would recommend all the people who are listening this uh, talk to go to this article of richard feynman on simulating physics and then in the in the same uh, context i would like to point out the quantum mechanical computers and here he claims why uh, quantum computers will be important and he uh, there is a favorite uh, one of the most famous quote by richard feynman that nature is quantum god damn it <laughs> so if you want to simulate it we need a quantum computer so in this paper in 1985, around uh, 40 years ago, right before I was born, <laughs> so he showed that uh, why uh, quantum computers are important for simulating uh, real uh, materials and solids and molecules and so on. And also for the audience, I would like to point out this book called Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by Neil Sun Chung. Uh, you might, uh, some of you already know it, but uh, I think having these three papers and some few, uh, these two books and this uh, book, this paper and books and few other articles will give you a solid background in this field. And then uh, you can try different algorithm and so on. But uh, before you start doing uh, just running some Qiskit or open circ or whatever those things, I would highly encourage to have some basic physics knowledge, uh, no matter if you are in physics or some other domain. So I would highly encourage to go through these papers uh, by Richard Feynman. Um, okay, so, oh no. This one is, I would also like to point out NISC or Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Computing. So uh, in no way uh, quantum computers are going to beat uh, classical computers in, in very soon in, in all of the tasks. We are still in the noisy intermediate scale quantum era, which means uh, the number of physical qubits, I think are is maximum, I think 128, I think uh, by IBM right now. And I um, mean, physical qubits, I'm not talking about something like D-wave qubit and so on. But uh, it's, it's, this process basically shows you that as we go uh, in the down the line with more and more qubits, we will have fall tolerant and high number of qubits. And that will be really useful for quantum chemistry. So our work, uh, such as this, what I'm presenting now, will use as a test bed, if you can say, for those kind of future uh, generation of quantum computers. Because again, you can have uh, billions of qubits, but if you don't know how to use that for solving a real life problem, what's the point? So this is the one of the motivation of using this quantum computation for uh, simulating quantum chemistry. And as you can, this is the Google CEO uh, near the um, quantum computation, uh, quantum computer at Google. And as you can see, quantum supremacy is a thing now, but still uh, application for quantum chemistry is still in the uh, development phase. So I would uh, encourage and welcome all of you guys who are listening to this talk to join this uh, really fascinating field of uh, quantum computation for chemistry and solids and so on. And there are, as you know, multiple uh, companies which are working on this uh, domain. Um, okay, so two key algorithms which are needed for um, 
simulating uh, chemistry on quantum computation or quantum phase estimation and a variation quantum eigen solver please note that there are many other algorithms qaa oa and some other many other but these two are very important uh, this came from the mit group i think 1996 so uh, and, and this week we came in 90 uh, 2005 from the alan aspori guzik group so this uh, lloyd paper and the uh, guzik paper are i think the key seminal papers in uh, using uh, the and these are published in science respectively uh, and these are really key papers for application of quantum computation for chemistry and materials so the quantum computer uh, quantum phase estimation idea is really uh, one of the key algorithms which says that if you want to know the eigen value you uh, of a particular unitary operator you have to have a uh, you have to calculate the phase of that particular uh, wave function you know the wave function you know you know the uh, phase of that uh, particular uh, wave function you basically know the eigen value that is basically one of the key uh, guiding principle of quantum phase estimation and there is a huge literature on this uh, there is a lot of youtube videos blogs papers on this there is no way i'll have time to go into details of this but i want to uh, i want to make you aware of these two key algorithms and the another is variation quantum eigen solvers so when people were working on quantum phase estimations they found that uh, using this method for uh, um, uh, on on nisc devices is very tricky uh, because nisc devices have a lot of noise and so on so they they proposed especially alan aspuru gazik group which when he was at harvard he proposed this idea of quantum uh, and classical hybrid algorithm so basically quantum uh, computers will generate the um, uh, state and then classical optimizers with classical computers will predict the uh, will do this optimization of circuit uh, elements or, or or the parameters so that is the hybrid algorithm called variation quantum eigen solver uh, i want to talk more about a little bit about vqe in this next slide so variation quantum eigen solver as i say is a hybrid classical quantum algorithm using risk variation principle so uh, here we know that quantum computers are good in preparing quantum states but not for optimizing and multiplying and so on so suppose you want to add two numbers 5 plus 2 is 7 right you will go to your calculator or your phone and type 5 5 plus 2 equals 7 so easy but if you want to do that on quantum computers you'll have to design your own circuit with for that and nobody wants to do that right that's one challenge and then uh, so for this reason one of the one of the key reasons vqe idea was why don't we leverage the good things of both classical and quantum world so let quantum world give you me uh, given a qubit hamiltonian and a particular initial parameter it will instantaneously generate a uh, 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 answers and that will go to a loop on in classical optimizers where you will try to optimize this theta which is the parameters of that uh, answers and do it multiple times until you uh, using the variational principle until you reach the minimum so this is the idea of variational principle so if using this if you use that it will give you the ground state or the lowest energy level of a particular hamiltonian or hermitian matrix so once you know that that will give you the ground state energy of the molecule or a solid so uh, if you want to know more about vqe there is a nature communications article by again alan aspuri guzik about 8 years ago uh, i will encourage you to go through this i think it's beautifully explained in this paper um, so suppose we have a matrix again coming back to linear algebra we have a matrix here and uh, using the uh, variational principle suppose we got the lowest energy level eigen value and its eigen functions now how do we get the higher levels higher uh, uh, energy level so for that what we use is something called deflate the matrix so you use the uh, eigen state and the eigen function of this uh, ground state and do this deflate the higher states to get the higher energy levels this particular method is called variational quantum deflation and there is a lot of papers which has come into this particular area but especially this quantum paper by hibbert variational quantum computation of excited states are is one of the um, key paper in this field so we will be using these two algorithms for our particular work um, so uh, if you want to know more about this uh, these two will be our these two are key papers in this i want to point out that vqe algorithm and vqd so far at least when i started working out like 2 3 years ago i saw that they are mainly applied for molecules like hydrogen lithium hydride beryllium hydride 
we are trying to calculate the interatomic distance various versus energy so basically they will get the calculate the lowest energy level of the matrix and they they will call that uh, energy so this is only it was only applicable to uh, molecules then i thought why not apply for solids so the problem was the kind of basis set that is being used for this quantum chemistry may not be suitable for solids uh, so this is one of the um, what is uh, this was one of the barriers why this was not applied to solids then i thought maybe we can use some other basis set so and one of the most, most simplest one and really uh, can give you uh, accurate band structure is tight binding uh, approach so this is one of the motivation and this is one of the foundation of my work that there was no application for solids um, so again few few more died a uh, few more animation then i'll go to the workflow so whenever we say quantum computation there are several methods to uh, uh, solve a quantum computation problem but one of the most Uh, commonly used is quantum circuit model please note that there are other models too but these are the uh, these quantum circuit models probably the most used mostly used so in in a in a quantum information theory so in a quantum circuit is basically a bunch of uh, several uh, um, um, gates and uh, entanglement and that gives you a circuit model and the, any quantum pro program can be represented using this collection of quantum circuit so so in this particular example q0 q1 q2 and so on up to q11 are the qubits qubits are again the fundamental building block of quantum computation unlike the uh, classical computers where you have 0 and 1 uh, just 0 and 1 this two pole it can go on all the other parts of the block sphere oh, okay this this uh, i think you guys know already that this is called block sphere and they can assume any of this uh, particular uh, um, angle or a uh, place in this uh, particular uh, um, block sphere and you have multiple of such thing working together with entanglement mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to uh, to predict the uh, to give you the initial state right so one of the key quantity what happens in quantum computation is find what is the what is the uh, optimized uh, what is the most optimized parameters of this uh, particular uh, qubits right so um i was thinking what's the best way to explain it in a in a non so technical way so one of the uh, in one of the lecture i heard this they compared this to guitar strings so imagine uh, that <clears throat> these strings you have to tune it right i i'm pretty sure you guys some of you have played guitar so there's a tuning there so you can tune the uh, guitar strings and then that that is basically your qubit parameters you can say theta 1 theta 2 and so on and then uh, for a rotational gate or hadamard gate or so i mean basically rotational gate we we mainly work on and then uh, you use the fret right so for c c uh, chord or g chord or whatever you are basically making them entangled you are basically connecting them and then uh, uh, you you uh, when you play the guitar you basically are trying to generate a, a quantum state this this is a particular quantum state for a particular tuning for a particular entanglement right so i think this is to an extent is right to you can uh, to compare the quantum circuit to a guitar but to an extent do not stress too much <laughs> there are so much other some other technicalities too but i think it will help you understand what is a quantum circuit is and when you are trying to optimize the parameters of the circuit so what you are trying to do is tune the parameters tune the strings kind of thing and also find the optimal entanglement and this this more more art than a science what is the best way to get this uh, done uh so we'll see that how is it is being done for solids okay so i'll in the next uh, i'll go to uh, this particular paper that i published uh, i think last year in july so it was uh, same as the uh, title of the talk how to use quantum computation and the code used is available at us nist clubs that atom qc uh, you can find some examples and so on there too uh if you don't have access to the uh, um journal version of you know, institute of physics you can go to the archive link as well uh, so before i go into the detail of this i i like to stop and ask if there is any question okay, okay. and there's there's one question yeah. uh, do you have um, the ability to, to analyze for example uh, materials which show the gun effect what effect 
It's, uh, it's a gun, G-U-N-N. -N. Gun effect. So I'm not familiar with this particular effect, uh, but I believe that if you know the eigenvalue and eigenfunctions of a Hamiltonian, you can use that to calculate any observable quantity. So I think this should be a way to calculate that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, there is a question from Yining. Uh, so he raised his hand. So uh, yeah. Yining, you can unmute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering the two algorithms that you present, was that um, consideration with entanglement or, the, or with a pure state that entanglements has been eliminated? Yeah, so without entanglement, there's no point of using quantum computer. So anything I'll show you will have entanglement. Yes. But uh, if you measure one, but that was already entangled with another one, how you ensure that that connection is 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 in control? Right. Uh, so that's a good question. So uh, I think what I understand is how to know whether entanglement is working is in a way, right? Um, you know, working or is not, uh, you know, is included or absolutely, ex uh, you know, excluded. Right. So it's basically trial and error at this point. Uh, and I'll show you when we, I'll show you in a few minutes that um, we tried different circuit with and without entanglement and what was its effect. I'll show you in a few, few minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, there are two more questions. So the first is, uh, doesn't quantum computation imply multiple probabilistic solutions? If so, how do you determine the correct solution? So you are right, quantum uh, computation usually mean multiple probability solution, but when you measure it, they collapse into one state, right? So you have to keep in mind that when you are measuring it, you have only getting one output. You're not getting multiple of such things. Okay. Cool, there's another question. Is there a particular method of constructing a quantum circuit? And uh, okay. Architecture uh, of the circuit. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting question. And I, I wanted to ask the same question to all the audience. If you know any um, universal recipe of uh, uh, finding quantum circuit, let me know. But I found there is no universal principle of um, like for this particular problem, you have to manually try and error different kind of circuits to find optimal circuit. So there is no universal universal recipe. Yeah. So I would I would say that it's it's similar to just inventing classical algorithms, right? So exactly. when you, you when you have a specific problem that you, you would like to solve, you have to think about uh, the algorithm. So in, in many cases, it's it's very difficult. So uh, some problems are still open in algorithmic theory. And it can be open for many years. Uh, so it's, it's the same in case of quantum computing. Yep. And if um, anyone there is, is There is one thing I'd like to say on that, though. Um, yeah. okay. I think when you're trying to uh, look at a quantum circuit or you know, to architect something, if you keep one principle in mind, which is to always follow the low energy path, to follow the most uh, the value function, you know, whenever, so instead of looking at it just purely from a particle point of view, think of it as a, as a value function, as a, as a way. And where do you get the most minimum path? Where is the most, because that's how nature always works. Mm -hmm. And if you design your circuit in the same way, in terms of where do I consume, where is the least energy being applied? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> that's, that's a good way to look at it, one of the ways. That is a great point. And there is a, I saw a few papers. This is called genetic algorithm for quantum circuit design. I saw some papers. So basically they fuse, like, you know, uh, you have the parents and then the mate, they have offspring. So they try to fuse different uh, quantum circuits and they evolve it in genetic algorithm to find the optimal circuit. I think I have seen this paper somewhere, but I don't recall right now, but I think people are thinking along these directions, yes. So thanks for bringing that so point. Yeah, so my benchmark always is when I look at the photosynthesis, photosynthesis is the biggest and the most efficient quantum factory on the planet in mm -hmm. terms of energy production. And it mm -hmm. always follows a valley function. And mm -hmm. if you remember yourself this photosynthesis, then and think of it in that way, it always helps. That's my that that's how I take it. That's a good observation. Yeah. Yep. All right. 
I think we can go on. I don't see more questions now. Okay. So moving on, uh, I thought I'll give a flow chart that how to use the, uh, if you want to simulate atomic structure, suppose you take from your periodic table, you take uh, aluminum, silicon, oxygen, or whatever combination, and if you design a particular lattice, like after aluminum, this is a silicon atom and so on. So this is called atomic structure. This is your input, right? So from there, you want to predict the band structure. Given the uh, this uh, atomic structure, predict me the band structure and tell me whether it's really metal or, or insulator. That's the problem we were trying to solve. So for that, first we need the uh, tight binding Hamiltonian. You can use something like, like density functional theory, but the wave, uh, if you use something like plane waves, the basis size is so huge, it's on the range of 60,000 or something plane waves that cannot be simulated to current quantum computers. So what you need to do is first get one year tight binding Hamiltonian. A one year function is a complete orthonormalized basis set. It's, it acts between, uh, it's a bridge between plane wave and localized atom orbitals, right? So this is a very useful function called one year function. If you want to know more about it, you want to, you can go to the one year.org and uh, all major density functional theory codes support generation of one year functions. You can use, for, use it for both electrons as well as phonons. So once you generate using density functional theory, the tight, uh, one year tight binding Hamiltonian, these are Hamiltonian, right? And you can then uh, transform into a two to the power n to do two to the power n matrix. Uh, so suppose this is an eight by eight uh, matrix is basically two to the power three to two to the power three matrix. Now you can use a three qubit quantum computer to simulate the system. So in the up in the rest of work, I assume I have a five qubit system. Okay. So because I think uh, one of the time I was working at IBM Kiskit, and this is so much. I think some of you know it's so much cute that you can only get like five qubit computers only. I mean I'm talking about a few months ago. Maybe the situation has changed. But so yeah, you can convert this one uh, Hamiltonian into a uh, n qubit uh, matrix, two to the power n by two to the power n matrix. This matrix can be transformed using Pauli basis, Pauli basis. And then once you convert and this Pauli basis using this, uh, this, these are the P operators, you know, the Pauli, very famous uh, Pauli operators, I, X, Y, Z. Uh, you convert any matrix, any Hermitian matrix on a Pauli basis that you can cast on a quantum circuit, that collection of all this R, R, X, R, Y, uh, had a Margate entanglement and so on. Now you can use variation quantum eigen solver on this quantum circuit. So you basically initialize with the particular uh, wave function or quantum state. Do uh, calculate the uh, eigen uh, calculate the uh, eigen value, and and tune the parameters using the classical optimizer using the variation quantum algorithm. And once you have the ground state energy uh, or ground state wave function, this is theta zero, the ground state, and the beta is uh, you can say it is the uh, um, it is the uh, uh, cofactor, or the, you can say the once you have that one, you can deflate the entire matrix uh, to get the higher energy level using variation quantum deflation. Now, once you get the variation quantum deflation, and here is the most interesting part: you can calculate something called Green's function, which is basically you have the Hamiltonian's uh, eigenvalue and eigenfunction, and you also have the eigenvalue at different n uh, quantum number. And then this is self energy in green function, which is usually taken to be zero. And uh, because we are using density functional theory is, is one of the limitations of density functional theory <clears throat> is that uh, in, in general density functional theory will underestimate band gap of the material. So it will not be very helpful to distinguish between metal and insulator. So if you use green functions and uh, use this uh, eigenvalue and eigenfactor from this VQD, you can calculate the green function to calculate the many body wave function. And if you know the many body wave function, you can solve the many body Hamiltonian, again, using the same uh, uh, quantum uh, uh, deflation algorithm to get accurate band structure. So in, in using classical computer is extremely challenging, but I believe that if uh, my goal is to get this green functions for solids right, so at least one of the key application for quantum computers is, uh, is getting accurate band gap predictions. So this is one of the most promising and very fascinating field, in my opinion. And it is a still ongoing work to solve the problem. So it is not I, I, yeah. Sorry, there's no, some question. Yeah, there, there are some questions. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one question uh, on our chat for sure. So um, 
do you, do you want me to read it now or please, yeah please go ahead okay uh, can a quantum processor using diamond nv be used for these calculations or only a formal quantum computing sure so this what algorithm i'm showing you the flowchart is agnostic of hardware okay let me make this clear mm -hmm. so once you have a decent uh, uh I mean, when I say decent means decent uh, fault tolerant and not so noisy quantum computer, this algorithm can be applied to any of them. So I tried on IBM's Cascade thing, which is I think based on superconductor based. Um, I think there's one in Australia. I think they're the one of the pioneers which use the diamond center uh, impurities in diamond center quantum computers. Uh, I think this, this uh, algorithm can be applied on those computers as well. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Well, the Green's function is your goal because it will determine the interaction? Yes, it will give you the many body, many particle picture. And it will map all the many body interactions in ensemble of bodies? Yes, yeah, that's the goal. I mean, this is a solved problem using classical computers, I want to say. There's something called dense dynamical mean field theory and uh, GW theory, which, which is already being used on classical computers, but not on quantum computers yet. So because there's something called impurity solver, which solves a bunch of Feynman integral and Feynman diagrams using all these uh, single particles. So you take the single particle Hamiltonian, construct your selector determinant for, for all the single non-interacting particle, and then use this impurity solver, basically a bunch of times to get the green functions. So my, uh, uh, my hope is, and this is uh, again an unsolved problem, my hope is quantum computers will be better at it, getting the green functions. Okay. Thank you. So one more clarification. Yeah. Are we, are we dealing here somehow with molecular dynamics? Ah. So you can use the same formalism for molecular dynamics as well. So what is molecular dynamics? So when we use uh, something like density functional theory or tight bending theory, we are solving um, um, what do you call time independent Schrodinger equation, right? But you can you can evolve the Hamiltonian in time also, right? And at particular temperature also. So that will give you molecular dynamics. So once we solve this problem of uh, the uh, static or um, what do you call non non dynamic Schrodinger equation, we can also calculate the molecular dynamics. It is possible using this particular formalism. So that could be the next goal. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, one, step, one step at a time. Yeah, there's, there's another question. Um, can we use uh, annealing, so annealer for estimating uh, the DFT? Um, I think there have been some work. They use something like a Davidson algorithm uh, for this optimization, but I think annealers, I, I, I'm not. Whether somebody has you. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, come, come out. Uh, so I, I had some technical issues, so I was not able to, uh, to hear you now. Uh, I'm not sure if other participants had similar okay. issues. Maybe you, if you can repeat, then it will be safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know uh, what part you missed, but uh, I said if there is any Let me see if my... Should I carry on or am I frozen? Uh, so now, now it's fine, but there's another question from Yining. Okay. Uh, the molecular dynamic, you know, on this slide, that uh, uh, algorithm, the mm -hmm. molecular dynamic, does it also show entanglement? Yeah, so whether it's a dynamic or static, nature in, in principle is, is entangled, right? All the particles, they talk to each other, <laughs> they're entangled. So when we solve molecular dynamics problem, a molecular static problem, they, there has to be entanglement term. Yeah. And the, the molecular dynamic that you mentioned, uh, or, or, or the other uh, gentleman mentioned, 
Is that means yeah. the molecular at excited status or the ground status, uh, meaning the two particle, two molecules entangle. And also, you mentioned this algorithm can be using for IBM quantum computer and other com quantum computer. Um, when we're talking about the quantum, oh, and also I think there is someone put on the chat say you know electron. So um, with a different charge, you know the particle different charge, the negative charge, or even a neutron. You know, neutron, right. you know, there's no electrical charge. That might be also mm -hmm. a difference as far as right. how they behave. Right. Yeah, so we have not simulated charged particle using this formalism yet. I mean, on classical computer, yes, they have done that. But uh, using this uh, particular workflow, we have not done that. We have done, we have only dealt with non-magnetic particles, uncharged particles, and at zero, uh, zero Kelvin, and uh, uh, what do you say? It's not. It's a static. It's not a dynamic function. So as I said, this is a very preliminary work in this field. Uh, this is just a step zero, not even step one yet. So it's a very evolving area. So as you as you guys are mentioning, there should be application on dynamics aspect. There should be application on temperature dependent effect. There should be. There are so many things to investigate in this field. Yeah. I think it. Molecule has a lot of things when we're talking about, you know, compared to electron, proton, or photon. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Both molecule and solids and hybrids. Yeah, there are so many things to solve. Yeah, using quantum computers. And um, yeah, um, as I said, these are the two GitHub pages that I'll try, I'll recommend you check out. So if there's no other question, um, I can move on, right, Fawil? Or should I wait? In fact, there's one more question. So uh, do you want me to ask it now or maybe we can oh, also sure. wait? Okay, yeah, so I... when the quantum computer produces a Green's function, is that a large complex object requiring a lot of storage? Ah, good question. So this is one of the motivation of using quantum computers that um, unlike the classical memory, by the definition of quantum mechanics itself, quantum computers, com computers will have huge memory. Right, it can, if you have like a thousand qubit uh, computer, uh, quantum computer, it can, so it can store two to the power thousand over two to the power thousand matrix. That's a huge thing, right? And right now using classical memory, sol uh, storing this green function is a big deal. It's very difficult. I mean, it's a very memory consuming, but I think if you have qubit based uh, fault tolerant and uh, large number of qubit uh, quantum computers, then we can easily solve this huge many particle interaction green function. So ideal would be suppose you have a million qubits by in near future, hopefully if I'm still alive, I'll be able to see that you will have, you can store two to power million over two to power million uh, matrix, Hermitian matrix. That's a big deal. You can basically, I don't know, um, they say uh, there are a few trillion particles or electrons in the universe. I, I forgot how many, but the goal will be to, to solve the whole universe on quantum computers. That will be ideal. But uh, I just want to point out that using the uh, qubit formalism, you can store large matrix also. So, so you can also uh, store green functions. Yes. I don't want to be carried away too much. Uh, yeah. There is one thing I'd like to say on that basis. Um, yeah. I think one of the things to remember on the quantum computing world is that it's better to understand quantum processor or quantum side of things as more akin to a GPU in a computer for now and for mm -hmm. the next 10 years. Uh, because mm -hmm. even though we might have a lot of, uh, you know, X amount of um, quantum qubit, higher qubit, for example, the IBM Eagle processor, right? We may not see mm -hmm. a quantum memory for quite some time. And therefore, yeah. you know, I think the most nearest um, jump in memory we might have is something like from a DNA storage or something like that. But I think for uh, the for looking at it in the near future, I think it's better to see um, the quantum memory side of that as quantum computer to be like almost like a GPU. So just like we have on the current side, we have a GPU attached to an actual classical computer. All the, all the mm -hmm. calculation part will be then guided over to uh, a, a QPU or, or to a cloud server or something mm -hmm. like that. 
where this will be carried yep, out yep. and returned back. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There won't be like complete replacement of classical CPU, the hybrid thing, like CPU, GPU, there'll be like CPU, GPU, and QPU, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we can go on. Okay. So uh, for tight binding, especially, there are several packages or, or uh, apps in Jarvis called Jarvis Density Functional Theory. Jarvis one year tight binding Hamiltonian and Jarvis tight binding three body uh, Python package. Um, I won't have time to go into detail of this, but the idea is if you know the atomic structure, uh, in, in, uh, you can use density functional theory to calculate band structure as well as the uh, uh, one year tight binding Hamiltonian. And we have made an app basically. This is an app in Jarvis website. Suppose you want to simulate silicon. And then you can you can get the uh, one year tight binding parameters easily using this app. Uh, so I'll, I encourage you to look it up, look at it. One of the limitations of one year tight binding though is if you want to deform your crystal, then your parameters will not work, might not work. So in this, for this reason, we developed something called TB three pi package. So this is uses something called quantum espresso which basically uh, projects your uh, density functional theory wave function on some well-defined orbitals, uh, selector orbitals. And then uh, we fit that to generate uh, the two and three body uh, parameters of almost all periodic table elements. So I'm very excited about these projects, but the, fr the idea is we have the framework for generating tight binding Hamiltonian for literally entire uh, periodic table. We have that, but it will just take a lot of time. Um, but we have done this for already a few thousands materials, if not trillion materials. So, uh, and we have also given this workflow publicly. So if, if you all to want to use this for your own material, you can do that too. And, and if you have any question, our team will be happy to help. Uh, we are a government agency and our goal is to, again, uh, help uh, people uh, who, uh, who are working in this field as much as, as we can to, to the maximum of possibility. Um, Okay, this is just tight binding approach. Um, and unfortunately, I won't have time to go into the detail of the tight binding approach. I'll go into the uh, most interesting part of this talk, the circuit design. So when I was uh, working on this topic, uh, if you know, uh, the, uh, kiss, the, there's Qiskit package, right? There are so many circuits there, quantum circuit. So I was not sure which one to use. I mean, so I started with this circuit where Suppose you have three qubits, Q0, Q1, Q2. Uh, you can take the rotational gates with parameter theta zero, theta one, theta two. That will be optimized using a variational principle and classical optimizer. Uh, this was the one simplest one. Or you can take Ry and Rz in combination. This is circuit two, let, let's call it. Or you can take the Ry and Rz uh, 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 gates, but with entanglement. Here, X will uh, represent the uh, control x gate okay so and uh, with the dot it will be control z gate so again i, I won't have time to go through this uh, what is c naught gate and also please please refer to a book or something so anyway so there are other well-known gates as well like real amplitude gate uh, circuit poly 2 design gate and there's something called efficient su2 gate where you have ry gate and rz gate and then another ry rz but they have uh, been have been uh, entangled using this uh, control X gate. I want to again point out that I think somebody asked uh, this question already, but without this entanglement, if you don't know how to entangle your circuit well, you cannot have any quantum advantage. So it's very mysterious how to, it's very uh, kind of art to how to get proper entanglement. So this is why there is a lot of trial and error. What should be the combination of RY versus RZ or what should be entanglement? How should we entangle it? It's a very open question and open area of research. However, uh, in Qiskit, they provide this efficient SU2 circuit, which I find to be extremely useful. And I use this for our particular uh, work here. And I'll show you not just this, but a particular repetition of the circuits also uh, is necessary. So again, I want to point out the circuit is, uh, is available at Jarvis package, a Jarvis core circuit quantum circuit library. And I have added only six circuits there, but I want to add a few more. And uh, I'm, uh, my goal is to find uh, a circuit which will give you the maximum representation of that Hamiltonian with minimum number of elements. Again, 
as you have more elements, the computation cost increases, right? So you want to minimize that. But at the same time, you don't want to sacrifice your accuracy. So there's a trade-off. There's a sweet spot somewhere in between. So that's the goal to find it. So currently, we'll use efficient SCU2 circuit. And I'll show you what happens if you use the other circuits. So suppose, uh, give me a second. Suppose we are talking about simulating aluminum. This is aluminum crystal structure. And as I said, uh, aluminum uh, in, in recipro reciprocal space has a brilliant zone and they are well-defined path in brilliant zone like gamma, L, X, U, W, and so on. This is called brilliant zone, right? So first primitive zone. So suppose you want to simulate aluminum band structure and not just band state, but just ground state energy. Forget about excited energies, just the ground state energy. Then we find that you can use either circuit number one that I showed you or two or three or four or five or six, and you'll get the uh, energy exactly matching the classical solver, which is great for gamma point. But as you go towards more other point like X point, you will see that only circuit four can be uh, lead you to the minimum energy. Others are higher. These are not uh, uh, four and six. So which was? Uh, for uh, real amplitude and the uh, efficient SU2 for aluminum gamma point. Only these two work. But if you go to more complex solids such as lead sulfide and you want to simulate X point, not just you have to use circuit number uh, six, but you also have to use uh, at least five or four repeat units. So basically, this is just one repeat unit and you can add on, on the side of it four more. So you need four at least to get the uh, uh, energy level of the ground state of the uh, PBS or lead sulfide correct, right? So you can see the challenge in this field already that you have to have a particular number of repetition and you have to have particular circuit to get the uh, um, accurate representation of your, uh, of your uh, function to get the uh, ground state energy. So in this, in this exercise, we found that all those uh, for this aluminum gamma point, all the circuit can be used if you want to go for more complex solids, you have to use circuit six, which is this efficient ST2 circuit with at least four repeat units. Also, I want to point out, um, you want to simulate for uh, thousands and millions and billions and trillions of material. There's no way we can, I mean, maybe you can, uh, if you have infinite amount of resources, you can go for each material and try to do the same exercise, which one works and which one doesn't work. But uh, for, for realistic purposes, we'll be using circuit six, which is the efficient ST2 circuit with five repeat unit, because this, this basically gives a uh, good representation for different combination of solids. So um, using this circuit six with five repeat units, let's see how does it work for uh, aluminum. So this is aluminum band structure with variation quantum deflation and exact solver. So this is a band structure of aluminum and the zero level is basically the Fermi level. As you can see, all the states are occupied here. So at the Fermi level, so this will be a metal. Aluminum is a metal, which is everybody knows. So um, using the variation quantum deflation, we found that um, if we use efficient SU2 circuit specifically with five repeat units, we can, we can reproduce the uh, electronic band structure. And not just the electronic band structure, but also we can use the finite difference method to calculate phonon frequencies. So phonons are other uh, quantized particles, basically lattice vibrations. And uh, we can also generate the phonon band structures uh, for aluminum. And as I said, VQD is a hybrid algorithm. So there's a classical plus quantum, very important thing to note. So there is a classical part there. So when you use classical optimizer, there are multiple classical optimizers such as Kobila, SLSQP, conjugate gradient and so on. So even if you look at the gamma point uh, and you try to uh, calculate the energy levels using different algorithm, we found that you have to use either SLSQP or Kobila to get the, um, get the eigen uh, value correct. So you cannot use, for example, uh, SLBFGS and so on. So this you have to be careful. So for the rest of the work, again, I'll use three components. First, efficient, efficient SU2 circuit. Second, four, five repeat unit circuit. And third, I'll use SLSQP algorithm. And then we'll compare with exact NumPy based uh, classical diagonalization software to uh, see how it is performed. As you can see, for aluminum, it progresses so well. So 
is like almost all the points are right on top of the classical solver, which is very promising and very exciting. So this was phase centered cubic aluminum, right? We can solve the electronic structure problem. How about the complex solids like aluminum oxide, silicon oxide, silicon nitride? So in Jarvis database, there are such 70,000 materials right now using density functional theory. And limiting our case to be uh, five qubits, that means we can, uh, assuming you have only five qubit quantum computer, we can simulate like two to power five to two to power five, that is 32 by 32 matrix. Uh, we have such thousands of such systems. So uh, we, we tried this for electrons and phonon bind structure. For phonon, we tried 930 material. That is the, this is a PHN is a phonon and uh, the electron is the EL. So one, yeah, one important point to note is the VQE and VQD algorithm. If you just multiply a minus one to it, it will give you the maximum value. So this can be easily used to get the minimum value of the Hamiltonian as well as the maximum value. So uh, we are trying to cal calculate using the VQE algorithm, the minimum uh, value using quantum computation and one using the phonon NumPy solver. As you can see, there's a beautiful correlation here. So our efficient SU2 circuit with five circuit seems to work. But again, there is, uh, I'm not claiming that quantum computers are replacing class computer computers tomorrow. It's just a proof of concept that it can work. Um, and this is just the phonon electron part for thousand solids. But I think in my opinion, it can be applied for other materials also. So in principle, we have we have established a workflow. We have found our sweet spot I mean, to a certain extent, uh, uh, a representation which is efficient SU2, which can uh, basically represent all the combination of at least for this particular system of materials. Um, so if you want to know more details about this, this is at the Atom QC package. Uh, you will have the VPE minimum energy and, and NumPy solver and you can plot it and plot it and reproduce the paper by yourself. Uh, you can find more details again in this uh, GitHub page. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to raise an issue here. Um, and I'll be, uh, I or someone else will reach out to you. So uh, so yeah, we, we apply, this is probably the one of the highest uh, systems, highest number of systems that's been ever applied to uh, for molecular or material design. Usually are people limited to hydrogen, helium, beryllium, and uh, lithium hydride, but here we are show we showed you we prove it to you that using this one year tight binding approach and this particular circuit design, we can simulate up to thousand such materials, which is a big deal. Um, so this was the electronic structure using the density functional theory, and as I promised, we can also use dynamical mean field theory by after calculate the green function. So the dynamical mean field theory is a, one of the most popular technique for creating electronic band structure, especially for correlated system such as with uh, vanadium or cobalt and so on. So if this is a many body uh, problem, it's not a single body problem now, but it can, it needs the input. Uh, it cannot start, I mean, you can start by itself, but it needs the input and our input will be the BQD eigenvalue and eigenfunctions. Once you know that the HK or at a particular K point, the eigenvalue and eigenfunction, we can start with zero impurity and calculate the green function and you can then calculate something called spectral function, which is an imaginary part of this green function and sum over your all the K points and also calculate DMT hybridization function. There are some plot of it, I think, uh, for delta. And then that goes to an, something called quantum impurity solver, basically construct the whole uh, <clears throat> interacting uh, selector determinant and solve uh, thousands of Feynman integrals and then gives you the uh, interacting uh, green function. That can give you accurate band gap, uh, right? So we are not there yet. We have not implemented that on quantum computers. It's a, still a very challenging topic, but I think it's possible in near future, in coming few years, our group will be able to accomplish this task, I believe. And then uh, we will show you that how we can use quantum computers to solve DMFT problem as well. So um, now I would like you to pay attention to this. Uh, uh, I think, I don't know how are we doing with time. Um, do we have some time to go through this hands-on session? Like I'll show you some demo. Yes, yes, I think so. Um, Helen, I guess we are not restricted now, right? Oh, no, I, I, I think we can go on. Yes. Okay. okay. So let's, uh, I'll paste this chat uh, in the chat, this link also, so you can try yourself. Uh, it's, it's already on the GitHub page also. Um, okay. So this one, what we can do is just, 
copy paste on your um, browser and so this is something called google collab notebook uh, if, if you are familiar with it so it will ask you to log in with your gmail or something like this account you can also run it in your normal ipython notebook so this notebook shows you how to use Qiskit and quantum circuit to plot band structure and simulate band structure of aluminum. It uses Jarvis tools, Atom QC, and Qiskit package. And again, you can find more details in this paper. So let's install some packages like Jarvis tools and Qiskit. And it will ask you to run anyway. So it will install first all these packages, allocating something. So let's wait for a few seconds. As you can see, it's, it's, uh, it installed Jarvis tools, Qiskit era, Etera, Qiskit air, NumPy, and other libraries. done its installation now we'll go i'll explain this a little bit so here um, we have provided some module that you can easily get the tight binding hamiltonian parameters for a particular solid so for example for aluminum the jarvis id of aluminum material is called jwasp 816 it's just the id of that material and if you give this input to this uh, get one year electron tight binding hamiltonian it will give you the one year tight binding hamiltonian the fermi level and atomic structure that can be fed to the something called Hermitian solver. And as I said, uh, we are using something in Qiskit called uh, state vector simulator. <clears throat> but, but you can simulate it on actual quantum computers. Yes. Uh, come on, it, it looks you are freezed again. I think. But there's, yes. there's um, at the key point. Sorry, there was something. You're searching through, I think you said, a thousand candidate materials. How do you, I know you have many more materials than that in your database. How do you constrain the search space to that subset? Yeah, so although we have like 70,000 materials, we have the one year tight banding Hamiltonian for uh, I think 2,000 materials only. So you can find the IDs which are possible in this one Atom QC and then uh, data, and then uh, for example, you want to talk about electrons. So you, these are the, these are CSV file, Excel file. You can see what are the possible materials, right? These are the only materials right now we have simulated. Okay. Okay. You can use any of those. So, and uh, you have to basically provide this Jarvis ID. Then it will automatically load the uh, hammer to, uh, uh, oh, Hermitian matrix. And then you want to pass this to a Hermitian solver, which we have uh, made in the Jarvis Qiskit package. And it will run this basically. Let me run that. So it will uh, first generate the quantum circuit for uh, one repetition. Again, I want to point out you need at least five uh, repetition unit to get reasonable uh, uh, representation of your wave function. But just for trial purpose, we are using the one and we are using circuit six model that I just explained. And this is a circuit six model with one repeat unit. As you can see, the classical solver gives you minus 3.0437 and the VQ solver with the state vector simulator is quite close enough, so it's not too bad. And if you want to increase the repetition unit or use another circuit, you can just make it like two repeat units. It will just take a little longer, but I think it will give you uh, also like accurate results. So as you can see, there are two uh, two uh, efficient SU2 circuit in series now. So and this, this was just for one K point. Uh, you want to uh, calculate band structure like showed you this is a one band structure it's, a, it's not a very dense k point you can increase line density to be something like 10 or something 
and it will calculate this same thing uh, for each each k point in the brilliant zone and for all the eigenvalue and then in this way you'll calculate the band structure of the solid right okay i don't know what happened uh, did i forget to import something oh this one okay. so as you can see it's now solving for 24 k points first k point is 0, 0, 0, which is also called gamma point so it will first construct the hamiltonian and then solve using the hermitian solver uh, workflow that we just discussed and this do it 24 times to get that band structure so uh, i let you do your stuff, basically uh, numpy value and vqe value you can see this is not just ground state but these are also high level states right so negative more negative it is the more uh, valence band it is in, you can say for electrons at least now it's k point zero is done now it's doing k point one k point two and it will do this for a bunch of other uh, so this is an example in this way i have also provided all the data that is used in the paper and you should have any question but all the data of both the electrons and phonons are there in this github repository so this was a quick hands-on session although i'm using kiskit here i have also uh, um, the tequila and penny uh, implementation which is uh, at uh, jarvis and you have Jarvis, um, IO, let's see, input output basically. And then you have multiple plugins such as Kiskit, Aquila, I think Penny Lane. You can use any of those to. Our workflow, again, is not dependent on any particular hardware or any particular software. It is just agnostic to all of them. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So, again, it's still running. So, I let it run. It takes a few seconds, it will generate a, it will generate your band structure basically. So uh, hopefully with that, I'd like to summarize my talk. We have a robust workflow for applying quantum algorithms to similar solids. We are not limited to high hydrogen and lithium hydride molecules anymore. We have applied to thousands of solids now, and we want to do millions and billions and trillions of minerals, um, hopefully uh, in coming few years. We are doing open source development. Feel free to uh, contribute or uh, ping us or anything as an issue. Um, try not to email too much. I, uh, I, I respond quickly on the GitHub rather than email. So please use the uh, issues. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity in this field. One of the most challenging and probably the most annoying is finding the minimal circuit. As you can see that I have to do multiple trials to find the minimal circuit. But is there any better way to find it? I think there's a huge interest in this field. And uh, next is the imputive quantum solver for DMT, which is still going on. So again, I'd like to uh, point out, this is a part of jarvis.nist.gov. These are the two uh, packages that we are developing. My email, my link, uh, Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever you want to connect on, I'm there. Feel free to let me uh, uh, connect me and we can work together. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, your interest, your questions, and all the organizers for uh, for organizing this such a beautiful symposium, although it's virtual, I hope it was someday it will be in person. So with that hope, uh, uh, I'll conclude here. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Kamal. It was really great presentation. Very interesting. Uh, take into account the, the amount of questions that we have. Uh, so actually, we have a few more questions. So yeah. the first one is, uh, wouldn't you want your greens function stored classically? So we can find any of the single particle averages you wanted. Are there advantages of storing it in the quantum computer? Hmm. So you are saying that instead of using uh, quantum computers, why not start having the starting orbitals from classical computers? Yeah, you can do that. Uh, but the idea is even if you have the green function, you need the Hermitian matrix solver. So the workflow idea is, is basically you give a Hermitian matrix and it will solve the problem for you, right? So but from that perspective, this is one of the reasons we use that approach. But you are right that you can start with classical uh, computer-based uh, orbitals and then feed to green function. Uh, and I do believe because we have this two to the power n scaling, we can store larger wave functions uh, on for green for the green function matrix. For green function matrix. So yeah, you can do multiple things here. We have just done one approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, there's another question. So you showed PBS as a more complex material. 
Uh, are safe and periodic groups more complex, difficult, or are more elements more complex, or a, a combination of both? Oh yeah. So you can imagine if you have more and more elements, they hybridize, they orbital hybridize in a different, different way, and then uh, they have a different K point also. So more complex the material, like uh, it will become challenging. So it's actually a very unsolved problem. Um, what materials will require least circuit, right? There's, is it possible? It may be possible that you can take sodium chloride and still the the circuit three might work. You don't know, or maybe one representation will work. So it's still an open problem. What do you mean by complexity in terms of quantum computation? It's a still ongoing work and unsolved problem yet. But uh, for the sake of generality, we choose this circuit six, but it doesn't have to be. That's, um, I, I want to make that clear. Okay, great. Uh, there's another question. Is there a known relationship between electron band structure and phonon band structure? Uh, yes, beautiful question. So yes, if you have uh, electrons, if you have like, for example, a metal, like uh, lead or aluminum, and you have a Fermi, uh, you have electronic state at the Fermi level, and you have an optical phonon branch, so they will couple to make something called Cooper pair, right? And that uh, give you, because of BCS Cooper pairing, it will give you superconductivity. So yeah, they are related, they can be related, and it's, it will be useful if it's related. <laughs> and one of the uh, uh, idea is using this uh, all this exercise to find better superconductors. If you have better superconductors, you'll have less quantum uh, uh, noisy hardware and you have <clears throat> better efficiency. It's kind of chicken and, and egg problem, right? So um, yeah, so electron phone coupling is needed to get better superconductors and they can be coupled, yeah. Great, and uh, there's another question. Uh, does Jarvis have support for Conda? Jarvis has what, so, sorry? Uh, support for Conda. Con Conda support is, for Conda. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, yes. Uh, yeah, so I think it is, yes. If you okay. go to the Jarvis thing and there's an installation page, Somewhere it will you can do conda install conda for Jarvis. I think, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, great. Um, there was another question, but maybe it has been already answered. Uh, do you run it on the Qiskit simulator or, or on the real quantum computer? Hmm. So, because it's so difficult, honestly, to get onto the actual quantum computer, this huge line. I use the uh, my own uh, state vector simulator mainly, and for one or two testing only, I go to the uh, actual quantum computer. Okay, uh, there's another question. How do you get the entire band band structure of a material uh, if the VQS solvers uh, for the ground state energy only? Yeah, yeah. So as I said, we. Is found using BQ. Okay, I think that you are you are first again. So maybe if you could, if you could maybe repeat. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm saying that uh, once you have the BPE. Uh, ground state energy, then um, you can deflate the ha Hamiltonian to get uh, get the higher states. Okay. Uh, there's another question, probably the last one. What's the identifier for the phonon band structure? What's the identifier for phonon band structure? You mean the IDs, the Jarvis IDs, I guess? Yeah, so they um, also have... Phonon IDC. So, if you want to go to the phonon, each material has their particular Jarvis IDC. You can get there. Um, so, similar to the get one year, where was this? Uh, get one electron, there's something called get one phonon. Okay. okay. Then you pass the particular ID that you want to simulate, and you'll get the, they won't have Fermi energy, you'll have the one year Tadman and Hamiltonian and atomic structure. Okay, great. All right. Uh, there's another question. Um, no, there was a discussion 
uh, has been already asked and answered, so we don't have to repeat. Okay. All right, are there any more questions? Uh, if you have time, I have one more question regarding slide 17. Slide 17. Hamel's favorite slides. <laughs> okay. Um, so the Q0, Q1, Q2, Q0 is a ground state, right? Oh, no, no. Q0 is qubit. Oh, qubit. So you have a three qubit, but one yeah. is named as a Q0. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, and then with the two gates, yeah. right? Uh, um, no, three gates. Some, some places is a two gates. R-Y and R-Z. R-Y R -Y and R-Z. Q gates. Two gates. Yeah, these are right. rotational gates. Right, right, right. But then, um, and then two gates, one is R Y R Z. And can you explain mm -hmm. on this part, on this uh, on lower F, on this tangled circuit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This. So what makes this circuit, you know, on the lower part, make this circuit will be able to do the, tang uh, you know, entanglement? Yeah, so, you know, um, you, you believe that, that when we have the uh, Hamilton matrix at a particular K point, it's required is a matrix element. You have that. Then to resolve that, you need sufficient entanglement. And what would be the sufficient entanglement? Nobody knows a priori until you try and error a lot of times. So we believe that having this particular entanglement that is zero to zero to link with one and zero to link with three and then one link with three is one of the The most promising thing. We are just saying that it worked out. This is one of the approach that we found that worked. And I don't have a um, straightforward explanation for this because it's a still unsolved problem. Is that the, uh, resolve that? That's why we can uh, capture that from that particular Hermitian matrix element, especially the off diagonal elements. You know? Mm -hmm. At okay. a certain moment, you apply this circuit with the entanglement with it. At some moment, those entanglement circuit was not. It, uh, was not applied to your measurement. So it's a problem I'm trying to say. It's not solved okay. like Thank you. Okay. Uh, there was a question whether the slides uh, will be available for downloads. Uh, I'm not sure if you can oh, uh, slides. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I usually upload my, if you go to the jarvis.nist.gov, I have have uh, uh, I think right. Click that, and you'll find a lot of my slide previous slides here from my personal account. Uh, I I think I'll upload mine for the this one soon on this one as well. So from there you can find it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, there was uh, one more question from uh, Zoom caller probably uh, or Doctor. Yeah. Hi. I Yes, I have a slightly, on. yeah, I have a slightly different question, which is, um, which is regarding your approach. Um, so mm -hmm. we're talking about two different domains here. One is, <clears throat> excuse me, material design, and the second one we're referring to the quantum computing side. Of it. So when you mm -hmm. move from doing this classically over to quantum computers, um, and then you know at some point in 2017 you probably come across this uh, IBM Qiskit. So mm -hmm. what sort of learning curve did it require to actually jump from where you were in the domain of chemistry, pretty much? Uh, you know, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, material banding, for example, insulators, semiconductors, and all that, to, the, to then mm -hmm. simulate in the, what, what sort of, and what was the motivation and how did you go about, uh, you know, making that, the switch so that you could simulate this over on a on a simulator. If you if you have time to talk about it, please. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can. Talk. Uh, thanks for asking this question. I think uh, I can. Uh, so I was talking to one of my friends, Andrew, and he showed me this book. 
I don't know if you guys can show this. Can you see this one? Quantum computation book. I saw on his no. desk. And, uh, no, we, we oh, cannot see the book. If you can show it, please. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I don't know. How about now? Can you see it? Quantum computation book? Yeah, yeah, if you could just hold it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So this one, I showed his in his, uh, on his uh, table and I started looking into it. And uh, uh, I was already familiar with the fem, uh, Feynman's idea that if you want to simulate nature, you need quantum computer. So when I read this, I got very excited. And then when I read the first few pages, it was so abstract that I was like, where to start from? How do I do this? You know, I, I, don't, I don't want, I mean, this is a very cool book, but how do I apply for solids So or, or material design? So I luckily I saw this uh, Kiskit uh, solver for hydrogen, I think. But uh, I saw that they use the Gaussian basis. So from my quantum chemistry knowledge, I knew that if you want to simulate solid, Gaussian basis are not the way. So then I started thinking, uh, what is the best way to uh, have like something like DFT or tight binding approach on Kiskit? So when I started working on that, then uh, we already had the one year tide man and Hamiltonian database at that time. And I have seen that some papers at that time that we are trying to solve the eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian matrix. So that's what so uh, I thought, why not connect these two different value and eigenfunction? And the way to generate a wave function percent was just combining these two different fields. Uh, and then uh, we started doing it uh, like for thousands of materials now. Um, so this was one of the motivation. And uh, of course, yeah, I was I'm already all I was always interested to use uh, quantum computation because uh, uh, we see that especially for many body picture like green functions. Classical computers can't be the perfect way to do it. You know, I mean, we are trying to do multiple algorithm development and so on, but I think uh, quantum computers might be very useful for generating the many particle wave functions, so starting from like single particle. So this was one of the motivation, and the path was like watching like uh, I don't know how many videos I watched on Kiskit and so on. Um, I, I remember uh, when I go to for a walk or something in the evening for an hour or something. I used to listen every day one lecture, something like this. So it was very casual. I never thought I'll publish a paper on it, but using this for a few years, I thought, yeah, this, this can work. So yeah, it was very non-linear way. It was not a linear path to get into there. Excellent, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, just was very curious. How did you make the switch? Yeah. Um, does it require a lot? I mean, by the way, how long did it take you from you know, learning the whole thing, as in to apply your domain knowledge into then producing three years or how long did it take you? Yeah, yeah, around three years. Yeah, it, it took some time. Yeah. Great, thank you. May I ask my questions? Yes, go on. Okay, one is kind of technical. You had a slide with expression Omega plus I delta. So that's uh, back maybe 10 or 15 slides. Okay, and let me... Omega, I, I know what it is. It's like related to frequency. And delta could be like in quantum mechanics, in classical quantum mechanics, it's the phase. Yeah, okay. So in omega is frequency and delta is uh, here is called time phase, right? function. Yeah. So I still remember my uh, advanced quantum mechanics. And the question now is a bit intuitive. Mm -hmm. Omega is given, but delta we can play with. Yeah. And if I am blindly or not playing with delta, can I cover more and more materials or can I accelerate or simplify your computations? I mean, if you know a priori delta, you have hit the jackpot, right? Nobody knows what the delta is. Omega, you are right, it's a, it's a x-axis of your response function. Right? 
in EV or something, right? But delta is the key part, and for this you require G. So one of the way we are trying to propose here that quantum computation might give you delta a little bit in a more efficient way, if not faster way. But um, yeah, this is the main trick here, getting delta, as you are right. Right. So there is a way, a point to, to look at playing with delta, even if you want to call it statistically or randomly or make it stochastic variable mm -hmm. and save some effort, computational effort, I believe. But that's very intuitive. Mm. My next question is, is very, very, very shallow kind of question because I forget to define, but you probably as a solid state expert, you know that there is a big issue or a big differentiation between gapped system and non-gapped system, right? Yeah, metal versus insulator. So how that difference plays role here in these considerations? Mm -hmm. So if you, especially if you're talking about dynamical mill spin theory, so uh, if you have the uh, metal case, getting green function is extremely tricky compared to the non-gap, I mean, gap phase like insulator. For insulator, getting the uh, delta is slightly easier, I would say, if not easiest. Um, but for metal case, that is with non-gap materials, it's extremely difficult to get because you have to resolve all the uh, key points in your billion zone. It's more difficult for gap systems. Um, and I, as you said, there, is, there may be a way to statistically, statistically calculate delta from their uh, number of electrons, atomic number, but I'm not aware of any straightforward way to calculate delta directly, um, unfortunately. If there is any, please let me know. I will be very and immensely grateful to you if you know any such method. I mean, there have been some math papers uh, in, in using classical computers to find the delta, but I don't think there's a straightforward way to get delta directly for all classical materials, whether it's a gap or non-gap material. But uh, so, I don't know. So this, these two points now about delta and the gap and non-gap, mm. it sounds from your answer that they're very, very closely related. Um, yes, delta for uh, delta for non-gap uh, materials is extremely uh, time-consuming, while for gap state. It's not that much time consuming, I'm trying to say, if you want to calculate. You know, because you need more K points. Omega is the same. The number of omegas for both which gaps. Points? I'm sorry, which gap point I need? Many uh, more K. which point? Many, many more K points. You see the K, K points. Here? Oh, okay. Many more K points. Okay. Yeah. For non gap For non gap exactly, like metals. Okay, wonderful. I will be in touch with you about some other questions okay. and maybe some some help with the uh, with the Python and the and the collab and all this. I'm not so straight strong in this, but I'll email you. Sure. Uh, Try to make just one email. Okay, sounds good. Just let me. Yeah, here's here's my email. Kamal dot Chaudhary at nice Yeah. Right. And thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's one more question. Yeah. Um, uh, how programming is important to learn quantum technology? Uh, mean programming is, is necessary. So it's quite a general question, but maybe you can share your opinion. Yeah. I feel like. Uh, you have to know the uh, programming as well, but you also have to know the ethics and uh, the how to know it, uh, do it efficiently. You know, so I'll show you one of my experience when we are uh, developing this Jarvis package. It is totally based on Python, right? So we had to use multiple things, uh, such as what's the best way to maintain it. Sometimes what happens, you you get your uh, upgrade in Python or some library, then the whole thing breaks. So we had to use something like linting and continuous integrations 
and uh, very uh, some uh, okay we okay. uh we of go not just code please not Oh, okay it looks that you you are free so uh Everybody. maybe you can, you can you can try to repeat but uh, um if there is no progress then i think that we'll just finish mm -hmm. clean we um we're afraid that we cannot understand unfortunately According. maybe i would just try to stop the video um kamal can you try once again called pep eight in python pep eight okay so i'm afraid that uh connection would probably not be better uh, so <laughs> There is, there is a general question. Can we get the speaker again in future? Uh, yeah. I believe that we probably we can. So uh, we can we can ask Kamal later. Um, okay. uh, Kamal, I think that uh, so your, your connection and the, the quality is not getting better. So I think that it's it's probably better to finish now uh, because anyway, um, most of the participants already gone so i think that we can finish for today uh kamal thank you once again uh, for this very interesting and great talk and also for answering all the questions and for all the discussions so i based on the comments on our chat i can see that participants uh, really enjoy this meetup so uh, we'll be happy to host you once again in the future so maybe there will be uh, some other questions as well. And I think that we can finish for today. So thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for joining um, the video and hopefully the slides will be available later. And we invite you to join us uh, next week. So thank you. Yeah, Have a good week. You, can, you can go ahead for the next events. Slides. Uh, I've already presented slides at the beginning. Okay, you did. Okay, thank you. Okay. Would you like me to present once again? Yeah, please do that. Okay, so maybe I will just present uh, the slides yeah. once again. Yeah, so next week um, we'll have a talk titled Quantum Circuit Optimization. Uh, the speaker and is Dr. Rasha Montasar. Uh, two, two weeks from now, from numbers to Tensors, a brief history of effective abstraction, and later a computer science oriented approach to introduce quantum computing to a new audience. So it will be four weeks from now. Then, how to succeed as a quantum computing uh, application startup it will be in April, 2nd April, uh, five days later. Um, the theory of quantum teleportation. Then quantum art and the quantum metaverse, 16th. And finally, Sunday at 9 a.m. this time, quantum computing and uh, quantum cryptography, 1st of May. All right. Hey, uh, by the way, can uh, Camel repeat his last question? Uh, if his Wi Fi is up again? Yes, Camel, uh, come on, baby, come on, you can try to repeat your answer once again. 
Yeah, for the last question for Mr. Kupta. What was the question again? Uh, his question is whether it's uh, whether programming is necessary. Yes, yeah. So I would say that it is important to have uh, the coding skill uh, for especially like Python or R. It's very important, especially for quantum computing. Not if you're doing the hardware design, then it might not be very important. But for software part, you need the coding skill. And in addition to the coding skill, you need to know the best practices in coding skills, right? Um, because as this new and new software being developed, uh, sometimes the new packages come and then your last package is not compatible anymore, you know, so that this whole thing becomes garbage. So um, this is why I'm saying that in when I was using the uh, Jarvis development or Atom QC development, I used something called continuous, continuous integration and PEP8 Python, like you can do C PEP8 Python. So I'm not sharing my screen. I'm not, I'm sharing. So like, this is the style guide for Python, right? Um, it says that what kind of, uh, what, what is the best way to maintain your uh, code? This is the PEP8 one thing. There's another, another thing called continuous integration. You can find more details about this on uh, like there are multiple such things how to do how to maintain your software well so not only you have to know the coding but you also have to know how to maintain it right and i think there are several such websites like real python and i don't know so many other videos are there that uh, that will help you guide that and uh, yeah just uh, just uh, remember that only coding is not important if you are doing something for long run if you're doing for a master's project or bachelor thesis, maybe it's okay. But if you want thinking long-term, you have to know the coding as well as best way of maintaining your code, in my opinion. Like if I see some ugly code, I usually spit on it. I don't even touch it. Like if I go to a, a software package and I don't see this kind of things like, um, where is it? Um, like you see all these badges here uh, on Jarvis. Uh, these things, these small widgets, is saying that I'm doing continuous and integration, it's passing. That means the current software works. And it says that my linting, linting is basically whether it's following PEP8 formalism or not. So these things, if I don't see in a package, I don't even touch that package. So it's very important that you know the coding and you maintain these kind of things as well. Does that answer the question? I think so. This this time was better. So, um, yeah, Helen, would you like to ask um, anything else, or should we finish? So I, maybe you can stop recording now. Mm -hmm. The recording okay. has stopped. Great. So the recording is stopped. Um, and uh, yeah, there are no more questions, so I think we can finish. Uh, it took it almost two hours, but it was very interesting and uh, many interesting discussions. So thank you, Kamal, once again. It was a pleasure to, um, to pass you uh, on our meetup. And uh, yeah, we are looking forward to uh, some new information about your research, and maybe one day you can just talk once again um, about your progress. And uh, yeah, we would also like Thank uh, everyone once again for joining and we hope to see all of you next time and on our next meetups. Thank you.